So I thought about what to speak to you about this morning, and I, I, and I know that um, perhaps living in Los Angeles, you think about uh, what ISIS is doing in Syria and Iraq, but you don't really think about how that's going to affect us here. Or you might think about what's going on uh, with the chaos in Libya or Yemen. Um, but again, it doesn't really affect us here in sunny California. But like many of you, when I heard about San Bernardino, I couldn't help but to think, whoa. Could have been here, it could have been us, it could have been me, I could have been there, uh, it could have been my place of work. And that's when politics meets our personal lives. And we think, wow, it's no longer foreign affairs, these are domestic affairs. And uh, as much as I don't want to speak about terrorism this morning, I thought we'll speak about a nice, light, comical subject like the current uh, presidential election. And I say that because we almost have to laugh about it, but it's pretty serious and it's pretty um, upsetting to think that in 2016, with everything going on in the globe, and I'll speak and try to connect some of the dots, um, as many of you probably already have done so, and then to think that uh, the, the distraction for this presidential election is coming um, you know, we're focusing on, you know, on the one side, you know, some, someone who wants to uh, offer you free goodies, which is impossible. Another woman who's been involved with so many um, illegal activities and, and, and fraudulent things that's being investigated but not being investigated. On the other side, you have mudslinging. And um, it's almost impossible to see who's going to be the president who can safely take us through this next era. You know, my uh, career was born in the aftermath of 9-11. <clears throat> and at that time, I was um, um, making my parents very proud by being both pre-law and pre-med. Um, and thinking, you know, that's, that's what you do when you have good grades and you just keep going and you keep doing. And 9-11 had such a big impact on my life. Because at that time, I took a look around at the media and I thought, Wow, no one really knows how to explain this. And it was like a coming of age for our country that no one could really put into terms. You, you would watch the coverage and, and everyone was just baffled. Everyone was just baffled. And I thought, you know, I had I'd stud studied all of this and I watched what was happening in Israel very often. And um, again, as much as we watch what happens in other places, it's different when it hits home, when it happens seven miles from where you grew up. And um, you watch what this country went through in the aftermath of 9-11, um, coming together. It wasn't whether you're blue or red or somewhere in the middle, it was that you live in this country and whether or not you feel patriotic, you want to keep your place of residence safe. It's as basic as that. And how that's been lost over the last 12 years, I have no idea. How has that been lost? How is it now political? Or how is it warmongering? Or how is it, oh, I'm anti-war. Well, are you also anti-reality? Because it can happen here. And this is not an argument to vote one way or the other. This is an argument for awareness, to be real, to, be, to, to acknowledge that the president, whoever he or she may be in 2016, who's elected into office, will have to deal with these realities. Um, I've prepared a speech for you guys here today, but it seems like this is such a nice, cozy environment that I'm really speaking off the cuff. Um, <clears throat> but I will leave um, plenty of time for question and answer because I think that's always the best part of the program. Um, I, um, you know, going off of San Bernardino, um, as many of you potentially were, um, I was very much disappointed in the reaction of our White House, only because, again, this was ISIS is here. And as much as we don't want to create this um, you know, alarmist feeling within our communities, we don't want the terrorists to win, we want to win. We want to have safe communities. We want to acknowledge our men in uniform. Thank you, Officer Ido, for being here. And I, you know, whenever you see men in blue, stop, thank them. They're risking their lives. 
and they're being portrayed in the media and in popular culture as the aggressors. And yes, those episodes happen, but those are fewer than the episodes that we don't hear about, about them risking their lives and saving lives and helping people just feel safe. When I was a little girl and I grew up on the East Coast and my parents would take me to Manhattan, I was taught if I ever get lost, you go to a man in a blue uniform. Young children today are learning if you see the man in the blue uniform, you run the other way. In, in major cities, and, and that's, you know, I'm comparing cities to cities. Um, and, and that's something that's also, you know, you look at the passage of time over the last decade or so and what these changes mean for our community. And I want to relate that back to here and this community. And I think many of you are already doing that, getting involved in your communities, building a stronger community, um, teaching your children if you see something, say something, be involved, know your, um, know your, uh, your leaders, um, however local they may be, because those are the people who can then pass on the message to bigger and bigger and um, all the way up to your congressmen, senators, <clears throat> all the way to the White House. So, um, I had prepared to talk to you about some of the numbers, some of the disturbing facts that um, led to something like San Bernardino happening here in, in California. Um, and about what that means for, again, for how does that come back to us? How does that affect um, what we're doing online, what we're seeing online, what our children are seeing online, um, what the schools are teaching here in our communities, and how that leads to recruitment, how that leads to someone that we may know right here in our communities could, be, uh, could find something as radical as graphic, as brutal, as terrorism appealing, and then give up their life for it. Um, and again, uh, this isn't, and I, I feel, always feel that I have to keep saying this and keep reiterating that it's not a, a partisan issue. Um, you look at the perpetrators and you look at their victims and you think, you know, in 9 11, did they really target just? A certain segment of the population, did they, at San Bernardino, they just target, you know, whites or blacks or, you know, Republicans or Democrats. It affects all of us here. Um, and that, again, includes building a strong community and allowing ourselves to build those bridges so that everyone uh, feels safe. So I will conclude with just saying foreign policy no longer foreign policy is going to be the key to the next election. It's not going to be about anyone's wife. It's not going to be about anyone's emails. It's going to be about choosing a president that can deal with ISIS, can deal with Boko Haram, can deal with the Iranian regime when our president sat down and gave them billions of dollars and now he's saying, oh God, they're not really behaving. No, they're not behaving. And these are the challenges. And you're going to be fooled into believing that the election will be about birth control. It's not. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to push one way or the other, and it's not going to be about abortion. It's not. And our country is not going to go to hell in a handbasket because of gay marriage. The economy is very important because you have to work, but more than that, you have to live. It's going to be about national security. And the bottom line is, get involved, know the facts, get educated, but also push for what you want in your communities because they have a plan and so should we. Thank you very much for your time this morning, but I really want to get to all the questions and I want to leave plenty of time for that, but. Lisa, you mentioned that you uh, had some numbers about things that led up to San Bernardino. Oh, sure. I, yeah, I didn't want to bore you with numbers, but. Oh, absolutely. So. Um, it's estimated so far that about 250, I, I always, well, and I'll tell you this, I, I don't think this is an accurate number, because this is documented. 250 Americans have gone abroad to join ISIS. Let's say it's 250, let's take a, a, a lower estimate. 73 so far have been charged, 22 convicted, and um, we already had, you know, um, CIA Director Comey in earlier, uh, at the, I think earlier in 2015, said that there are investigations that are open in all 50 states. Startling. And just last week, the Wall Street Journal 
said that there's 22 individuals still at large who were directly, directly involved in the Paris and Brussels attacks. Directly involved. And I said this to a friend and he said, okay, it's 22, I thought it would be much higher. 22 that were directly involved. It only took four to eight people for each one of those attacks. You do the math. 22 people who have, that means, knowledge, in-depth knowledge of European infrastructures, of transportation systems, of underground systems. These are, I mean, let's not allow what happened in Europe to happen here, meaning they are behind the ball so badly that I don't know if they can catch up. They have buyer's remorse, yes, from letting in the refugees, but you know what? That's not even the biggest problem right now because the people who are, uh, who are launching these attacks are already nationals. They're born there, they're part of the patchwork there, they've made home there, and it's not to say that that's a bad thing, but there's no culture of assimilation in Europe. And you know, people in the media who talk about no-go zones, they get flagged and they're not supposed to, who cares, they're, they might not be no-go zones, they don't want to go zones for law enforcement. Because every time they go there, there's a problem, so then what do they do? They're intimidated. What's intimidation? Terrorism. And that's what's happening in, in their communities. And we have to take a lesson from that before that, that happens um, here. So th that's some of the, the loose numbers in terms of the number of, of Americans. I'm doing more research in terms of getting some of these direct stories, what communities they're coming for, from, what, where we have problems, whether it's in pockets of Michigan, pockets of Minnesota. Um, we have uh, a few cases in, in, in those areas as well, but look, Anyone with a smartphone with access to Wi-Fi can get this information, um, and they do. And whether it's people from this side trying to link up with people from that side, you can, you know, study what, um, you know, how, how gangs recruit people, who, who do they prey upon, who are vulnerable enough to uh, fall into their traps. But on the other end, what ISIS is doing, they're recruiting our best, meaning people who are, who are graduating from film school, people who know Snapchat and Facebook and Instagram and all the great social media websites. Um, I troll a lot of uh, Telegram. That Telegram is, um, it, it, it's the safest site for them. They don't get thrown off of that account as often as they get thrown off of Facebook and Twitter and, and, um, and, and YouTube, for example. And there's always been that debate with American companies and, um, and law enforcement. Do we throw them off of these accounts? Because they're American platforms, why should we allow them to recruit on American platforms? Or uh, do we keep them on there? Because then we can keep an eye on them. What are they doing? Where are they going? What's next? So this debate will forever continue because we can all see why both sides are, are valid. Um, so, yes? Uh, absolutely. And as a somewhat free and open society, uh, at some point you can't stop whether it's domestic terrorism or foreign terrorism or ISIS, etc. Uh, you can do a lot to stop certain things from happening, but it's some things you just cannot because we're really not prepared. Right. Because, you know, anybody from the country can do anything. Absolutely. Okay, it, it's not either or, it, it never is. And I think that's the point that I would want to send you home with today in that it's so nuanced. You know, when we want to, if we want to monitor the mosques, for example, this is a huge thing for everyone. Do we monitor the mosques? We make people feel alienated in their own place of worship. It's awful, it really is awful to think that because it is their place to go to and pray with, just like a synagogue or a church is, but at the same time, if you know that there's activity going on there, and if there is some sort of radicalization going on there, if I were attending that mosque, I would want law enforcement to come in, right? So the thing is, yes, we want to engage, we want to bring people in, we don't want to make people feel alienated, but it's almost as though 
by drawing that line and saying, well, can we really win this way? No, but we can't lose this way either. Meaning, part of, you know, I, one of my, or two of my favorite leaders, global leaders at this point, are Jordan's king and queen and Egypt's president, al-Sisi. Why? Are they saints now? Do they have, you know, records of, of questionable behavior, yes, and decisioning, yes. They're calling, they are Muslims, they're calling on their own brethren to call this behavior out. They are calling on their own. I mean, this is what it will take. It will take them from the inside, from within the Muslim community, both domestically in this country and abroad, to help us. They want to stay safe too. Muslims died on 9-11. Muslims are dying at the hands of ISIS. Don't be fooled into thinking, well, you know, we hear a lot about the Christian persecution in the Middle East, and that does go on. Yes, they're the first ones to go. Why? Because they, don't, they won't bend and fold under the flag of, of, of ISIS. But it also is other. They're Shiites who are dying at the hands of ISIS, right? Who's the biggest victim of the Iranian regime right now? The Iranian people, not you and I, right? And these are the points that are lost, that are lost in the political correctness in saying, oh, no, 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 we can't go into that mosque. No. If I, look, if there's something going on here, will it offend anybody if law enforcement comes in? No, please come in. Keep us safe. And that's where we have to build the bridges. And it has to be, obviously, a very inclusive process to say to the leaders of these mosques, to say to the imams, we want to keep you safe. You need to help us keep you safe. Let's work together. It's not to go in and start, you know, busting people. And I don't want to believe that that's what happens in this country. Yes, Simon. A, a thank you, a comment, and a question. Okay, a go for it. Thank you goes to you for being a fresh breath of air. Thank I you. Mean, I watch you on Fox, I watch you, I, I read you, and I'm just mesmerized. I thank you. I you for, for, for the United States of America. The comment is that I don't see Islamophobia. 9 11 happened, and I am a citizen of the United States. 30 years This is the best country, and we don't discriminate against Muslims. Now, including them, makes no difference. The European included the Muslims and they're getting butchered left and right. So this ideology, Islamophobia, let's invite them and inclusive, to me, with all due respect, is nonsense, will never change. All of the terrorists who rammed their planes in the, plane, in the building were educated, they were included in our society. And so was this last killer who butchered his own friend. With respect to the question, I see it as a last cause. I see it as a last cause because I go through college campuses and I, I have, there's more anti-Semites than anti-Islam. There's more people discriminating about labeling a tomato from Israel than going to Boko Haram and kidnapping little girls and raping them and selling them. Uh, I have a Down syndrome brother-in-law and I follow this. <clears throat> there are multiple Down syndrome kids in Syria and Iraq that they put bombs on and they let them go and they blow them up. So to me, it hits home. Nobody talks about it. I mean, look, this gentleman is a, these are kind, good people, yet their mind goes, oh, let's be nice to them. There is no niceness. I don't see any niceness. So to me, the question is I see it as a lost cause. I see the ca college campuses. It's impossible. Is there a solution? Is there a way for us to educate these people so they understand that who is the enemy and what do they I think this, thank you. I think that there, the issue in this country is that up to a certain point, and maybe it's, it, maybe it is pre-9-11, um, up to a certain point it was that the education comes from um, elites. And what were those elites? Whether they are <clears throat> the message, meaning societal messages, and I don't just mean politics, meaning who sets the tone for our economy and who sets the tone for society and who sets the tone for politics and abroad, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it would usually it comes top down. This CEOs, college professors, the media. Now we're seeing this going ground up meaning the trickle is going from the puddle on the, the dirty puddle on the ground is going up meaning you have bloggers online who are, n are not responsible journalists spreading activism not journalism you have college professors who do not belong at the pulpit because if you are at that podium there's a huge level of responsibility that responsibility is to give those young children who come to college the only reason these days is to go to college for four years the only reason is to get a thinking degree 
Because we all know that those four years are going to set you back. If you went to work at 18, you'd make more money by the time you're 22 and forward that to 32. The studies have been done. Unless you're getting some sort of vocational degree. And I don't mean to knock everyone's education. <laughs> I fell for it too. <laughs> Uh, my point is that the messages that are running our society are coming from the wrong places. And Fuel the Burn campaign, that's the best case study for this phenomenon. Because, you know, regardless of how you feel about Bernie Sanders, and I don't want to knock any candidate up here, but I'm just saying it's, it's mind-boggling that in 2016, the, this capitalist nation, capitalist nation, that threw tea into the ocean to separate itself from the UK and get its uh, independence. It, it's giving, it, it has this surge of, of support for a socialist, a, a self-proclaimed and proud socialist candidate. It's mind-boggling. I mean, no matter how you want to look at it, this is, this is a historic thing that we're witnessing. And that just, his popularity is based on a lot of this, um, you know, the college campus, uh, type of emotional thing. And that emotional thing is based, it's rooted in one thing. And whether you love him or hate him, somewhere in between, this administration has popularized an ap apologetic America. We are always wrong and we are always shamed. Meaning, the terrorists are doing what they're doing. How could we find a way to blame ourselves? Okay, they don't have jobs, they're not educated, they're feeling alienated in our society. Okay, you feel alienated in our society, you go to, where's the self-help guy? You go to him, he's awesome by the way. He was, um, you go to him, you go get some help, you find, I mean, there's so many ways of, of working through this and, and not really allowing um, for the excuses um, but I think that's, again, that goes back to the, 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 this new feeling in our society where, like, you're last place, but you still get a trophy. We grew up so competitive because that's the way it was. You want a trophy, you've got to work at it. Um, and I think that, you know, we're going to see a balancing of this. I think our country is going to go so far one way in terms of this, and it's just not going to sustain itself. We have to get back to a place where we can have those feelings and emotions and we can make people feel good about themselves, but at the same time be realistic about what our priorities are and how we can keep ourselves um, safe.